Hello and welcome. My name is Clara Moskowitz and I'm a senior editor covering space and physics at Scientific American. Thank you for being here with us to learn more about the life and times of Galileo. Joining us today is astrophysicist Mario Livio, author of Galileo and the Science Deniers, which just came out in May from Simon & Schuster. Tell me about the inspiration for the book. What made you want to write about Galileo at this point in time? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, uh, there are at least four, on, four main reasons uh, in no particular order. Uh, I mean, one is that, you know, I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, Galileo uh, is certainly one of the founders of modern astrophysics, so he was always some sort of a hero of mine, so I was always very interested in him. That, that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that I discovered that a very few of the existing biographies, some of which are absolutely excellent, uh, were written actually by uh, real research scientists, research in, in, in the active sciences. I mean, not um, uh, science writers, science historians, you know, and so on. Um, so I thought that it would be inter interesting because I would put perhaps its discovery somewhat in the context of what we know today and things like that. Uh, the third reason, was that many of those biographies are, are very scholarly of nature and they are really not that accessible for um, many people i mean I, I have even a friend who is a phd chemist and you know i, I talked to him while i was writing the book and he told me uh, remind me what it is galileo has actually done <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that to me was a kind of a sign and finally but definitely not least is the thing that my feeling was that actually science denial is rampant today. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to draw these parallels and, and things between then and now. And uh, I thought that this is a topic that really needs bringing up. Yeah. So I'm sure that, you know, you learned more than you probably had already known as you did research for the book. Tell us, um, you know, what, what's something that most people might not know about Galileo that they should? Yeah, uh, I'm sure that there are many things they don't know uh, about Galileo, but uh, perhaps let me mention a few. Uh, first of all, Galileo's name is uh, associated with many myths. Uh, and the myths, some of them were created by his first biographer, who was his student, uh, uh, Vincenzo Viviani, uh, and others over the years. Uh, so, for example, uh, Vincenzo, almost everybody thinks that Galileo dropped balls from the Leaning Tower of Pisa uh, in order to see how they fall. Now, it is absolutely true that Galileo was interested in free-falling bodies. And he actually did experiments with falling bodies because he believed that, well, not initially, but eventually, that irrespective of their weight, falling bodies fall at the same rate and not that heavy bodies, like Aristotle thought, that heavy bodies fall faster. Uh, in fact, proportional to the weight, Aristotle thought. Um, but he never dropped them from the Tower of Pisa. And the reason I say that is that really none of the people who wrote about these experiments at the time uh, mentions him doing it from Pisa and neither did Galileo himself ever write about that thing you know like this so it comes from Viviani but uh, it probably never happened another you one made it up where, where do you think Pisa came in it's just too good a visual image uh yeah you know Galileo was in Pisa I mean he studied in Pisa so uh you know for sure and uh, look there is another thing uh Viviani came and became a student of uh, Galileo when Galileo was very old, Viviani was very young. Uh, both the very old and the very young are likely to invent some stories <laughs> or embellish existing stories. So, you know, it's true that Galileo dropped balls from various heights. Uh, why not from the Leaning Tower of Pisa? But apparently that one is one he didn't do. Another one uh, you actually can see in the image that is shown now, and that's a story that when Galileo was a student already, when he was some something like 19 or so, um, he watched in the cathedral in Pisa a lamp, and he looked at the swinging of that lamp, and by uh, 
counting his heartbeats, he determined that the period of the swing is constant. Mm -hmm. uh, and that he used that later to actually construct a, a, a machine that will measure the pulse of people. So again, it is true that Galileo experimented with pendulums. Uh, and uh, it is also true that at a much later date, uh, he, he did write about pendulums. But uh, the story that uh, Viviani tells us again, uh, the particular lamp that he's talking about uh, was only installed there, it turns out, four years after Galileo already left the place. <laughs> now, it's possible, of course, that there was some other lamp in that place before <laughs> that, uh, but, uh, you know, the story may or not may have been made. It, what is certainly sure, he never invented that machine to measure, because such a machine was invented some 20 years later, and Galileo was always, you know, very, very aggressive about somebody trying to take away credit from him, uh, never say the word. So he probably never invented that machine. Uh, there is another thing that uh, I would like people to know about Galileo. Galileo, of course, lived during the late Renaissance. So uh, he was literally a Renaissance person. But we use that term today to talk about people who, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci, people like that who know in many fields and so on. What mm -hmm. people may not know, they know Galileo the scientist. Well, Galileo was a Renaissance person. For example, he did study drawing and uh, not, not just studied it, but he studied light and shadow and all that. And when he did his first observations of the moon, he did this fantastic wash drawings of the type that we see here. Uh, and that, only because of his understanding of these drawings and light and shadow, he was able to understand what he was seeing. Because you see, there was another astronomer, Harriot, who also observed the moon at the same time. And his, his drawings just look like some squiggles. You cannot tell what, what it is you see there even. In Galileo's case, if you will look carefully, I mean, the image here is small, but if you look carefully at the bottom right image, you will see that there are points of light in the unilluminated part of the moon. And those, Galileo understood that those were tops of mountains that were being lit by the sun. And then the, the light creeps down the mountain as, you know, as things go come into view. So, he understood all of this from his understanding of, of drawing. Uh, he also was a, a great, he, he knew the great poets. He could cite entire pieces from Dante. He gave two talks about Dante's Inferno when he was 24. Uh, he, uh, he loved a, a poet called Ariosto and he wrote an essay about him. Uh, some of his friend, best friends, were painters and, uh, uh, for example, the famous uh, woman Renaissance painter Artemisia Gentileschi was a personal friend of his. Um, uh, there is even a story that uh, she changed one of her famous paintings uh, because uh, he told her how is the trajectory of projectiles, you know, that they do a parabola and she did, uh, she, she painted Judith and Holofernes and the blood was coming out of his neck because she beheaded him and she drew that the blood was squirting and doing a parabola in the air <laughs> uh, and stories that he, she learned that from Galileo. So, so Galileo was in many ways a, a, a Renaissance person. But one other thing, maybe last thing that people don't know is that Galileo wasn't the nicest person. Uh, he, he was really self-righteous and uh, he, you know, he, he was very nice to his family uh, and some of his friends, but to his adversaries, boy, he was, he had a sharp tongue and a sharper pen. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he really uh, did not behave at all very nicely to those. Hmm. Yeah, well, speaking of his adversaries, tell us a little bit about the the climate that Galileo faced um, and, and some parallels 
uh, that to, to what we see today in terms of attitudes toward science? Yes, so uh, Galileo's clash uh, was uh, with the church. Uh, this, this painting here supposedly shows him at his famous trial, uh, only that the trial didn't look at all like this. <laughs> Uh, there were maybe like, uh, except from Galileo, there were maybe two or three other people in the trial. That was it. Uh, there was Vincenzo Maculano, who was the main prosecutor. There was the guy who was asking the questions. His name was Sinceri. And there was a, a guy who was taking notes. And that was about it. Uh, even though the Inquisition, of course, there were all the cardinals. Uh, but anyhow, um, so look, very often it is described that this was a clash between science and religion. This is not true, and Galileo never saw it as such. The clash was between science and literal interpretations of the Bible. So it was not between science and religion. Galileo himself was a religious person. Uh, he actually always said that the Bible cannot be make any errors. But he also made the point that the Bible was not written as a science book. It was written for our salvation. Uh, so he, he, he pointed out, for example, that even the planets are not named in the Bible. Uh, and so therefore, when there was an apparent conflict between literal interpretation of the biblical text and some scientific observation, he said, it means we didn't exactly understand the, the, the text and we have to reinterpret it because he said the Bible cannot be wrong. Um, so in some sense, he was even almost trying to save the church from making a mistake, uh, you know, by, 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 by doing this. And, and this is a very, very important point because it, it really was not between science and religion. It was, you see, one passage that is mentioned a lot, I mean, and he mentions a lot in the book of Joshua, there is a passage where uh, uh, the Lord commands at Joshua's request, uh, the sun to, you know, stay fixed uh, about the Ayalon va Valley, uh, you know, until the war finishes and things like that. Um, so uh, the theologians took that to mean that, you know, it means that the sun is orbiting the earth because the Lord stopped the sun. Uh, Galileo said, no, I mean, this is a poetic way of presenting it. I mean, it would have been much easier to simply stop the rotation of the earth, you know, I mean, uh, around its axis, uh, instead of, you know, dealing with the whole celestial uh, architecture um, and, and things of this nature. So, um, so this was the real clash. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he, didn't manage to convince because you see the theologians they didn't like scientists getting into the business of interpreting the bible uh, so uh, galileo of course was a great supporter of the copernican model in which the earth and all the other planets revolved around the sun um, and uh, so that really basically took the earth from its central position uh, and they didn't like that. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a, a, a technical but important legal issue, which was that uh, in 1616, there was an injunction against Galileo. He was told prohibited from teaching, holding, or supporting the Copernican view. And then 17 years later, he wrote this book on the two chief world systems where Basically, anybody who read the book could tell that he supports the Copernican system. And so he basically violated that injunction. So he was put on trial. Uh, and uh, this didn't end very well. Do we know much about popular sentiment at the time? Did most people agree with the church? Or did Galileo have a, a big group of people siding with him as well? He had, he had some personal friends, uh, some of whom important people who, of course, supported him. Yes. And, and they tried to advise him uh, sometimes from, uh, you know, being his own worst enemy by, you know, being too 
forceful in what he said and things. Uh, it was also the case that in the Protestant world, you see, I mean, this was, was the time also of the Thirty Years' War and all that. Um, and in the Protestant world, there were many, many more scientists already at the time who accepted the Copernican model. But in the Catholic Church, and in particular, you know, the Pope at the time, Pope Urban VIII, and people around him uh, still tried to save the Ptolemaic uh, model in which, uh, you know, things revolved around the Earth. And they had a way out because there was a model uh, proposed by uh, astronomer Tycho Brahe, uh, which said that all the other planets revolve around the sun, but the sun itself revolves around the earth. And in fact, Galileo's observations even never really ex excluded the possibility of this model. Mm. Uh, Galileo didn't like this model because for various reasons, but uh, you know, it, it was, in today's language, we would say it had too many moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this around the sun, the sun around the, you know, things like that. Um, so he didn't like this. But um, so so in the in the deep Catholic Church, um, they objected to him. Uh, but uh, there were people who, who supported him, especially maybe outside of Italy. So in terms of what we see today, do you think that religion or these questions about strict interpretations of religion play a similar role in, in the science denial you find today? No, I, I actually think that religion um, plays a, small, a much smaller role today. Uh, as I pointed out, I mean, the conflict then was mostly between literal interpretation of scripture and what science shows. Uh, there are some with whom this still holds. Uh, for example, uh, you know, there is a significant percentage of people, uh, I mean, a, a Gallup poll a few years ago showed that there is still, you know, some 30% or so of Americans who think that uh, humans uh, were created in, in their present form uh, less than 10,000 years ago. Um, so that, of course, does rely on, you know, biblical, you know, taking the, the biblical text literally. So there are people like that. But most of the science denial today happens not because of religious reasons. Most of the science denial today happens because of economic reasons. For example, you know, in the case of uh, climate change, let's say, uh, because of political reasons, uh, most of the time, again, climate change, but also COVID-19 and things like that, uh, you, you know, wanting to be elected in certain elections and so on. So it's mostly, I would say, political, economical, um, and then much more so than uh, things like um, and there is, you know, there is, unfortunately, there are so many conspiracy theories that also contribute to this a lot. I mean, you know, there are all the anti-vaxxers, you know, things, things of that nature, uh, uh, various groups, uh, QAnon, you know, uh, things that are, are um, outside the realm of, uh, you know, I would say, scientific reason. Um, that that enter into this game as well. Don't you wonder what Galileo would think if he could fast forward 400 years and see that scientists today are being met with the same kind of resistance he was met with, basically just because the people in charge don't like what science is telling them? I mean, would he or 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 anybody have expected us to have moved maybe beyond that by now? I think he would have been devastated uh, by this. L look, I mean, let's first understand. Pope John Paul II already announced clearly in 92, announced clearly that Galileo was right and the Inquisitors <laughs> were wrong. Okay? No question. Pope Francis, the current Pope, 
announced that the Big Bang theory and Darwinian evolution do not contradict religion. So two popes already, you know, declared this very, very clearly. So what do some people need more <laughs> than to hear this and this Galileo? Galileo, for example, would have been absolutely stunned by the fact that there can be today people who, because of political reasons, uh, would make decisions that affect either the health of people, and in, as in the case of vaccines, or in the case of the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic, or that there are people who, you know, literally put in danger the Earth's biosphere, you know, like through climate change. Uh, I, I don't think he would even, you know, <laughs> understand how this is at all possible. Uh, look, let's forget Galileo for a second. I mean, it is never a good idea to bet against the judgment of science. It was never the case. Why? Not because science is always right. Science can be wrong and has been often wrong, yes? But it's the best thing we know at the time. And science has this ability to improve upon what it says, yes? As more data, for example, in the case of COVID-19, okay, it's a new virus, nobody knows about it, anything, and so on. So what, what do you do if you have a case like this? You say, first of all, because I don't know, I first of all do the simplest things. You know, let's try not to get sick. <laughs> when you enter a, a normal hospital and you enter, let's say, the, the operating room or something, right? What do you see? You see doctors and nurses who wear masks, right? Why do they wear masks? They wear masks <laughs> because they don't want to transmit anything between, you know, the patients and, and, and the staff, right? So do that, even before you know much more about the thing, you know, washing your hands. I mean, I do that when uh, my wife has the common cold, you know, <laughs> I, I, I keep washing my hands and, and things like this. Then there are other things that you learn with time, you know, I mean, you, you try to find some medications, you try to find vaccines, you try to find it, right? You, as you learn more, science corrects itself. All the time it corrects itself. Uh, all science is provisional and the scientist would be the first to admit that. You know, all theories, I mean, Newton's theories, yes? Some of the most fantastic things in, 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 in human history, yes? You know, were superseded by Einstein's special and general relativity of course. Now, because Newton's theories were great, they did not become obsolete. They are just now embedded in a grander scheme, and they are limiting cases, you know, when velocities are not too high and so on, Newton's thing work fine. You know, we send things to the moon based on Newton's physics, basically. Uh, so, it is... Uh, this is what science does. But to think that somebody can bet against science when either human life or the future of the Earth's biosphere is at stake is just unconscionable. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's comforting to know that Galileo did ultimately win this fight with the church, uh, but it took until the 1990s, did you say? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it took 350 every... years. Yes, it took 350 years. That's too long. You know, if, if you're talking climate change, that's way too long. Right. I mean, you have to wonder why every pope until then had reviewed the evidence and said, no, I just don't think the science is there yet on, on Galileo's issue. I think we, we're not sure yet about the Earth. Well, it's, it's worse. I, I tell a story in the book. I have a whole chapter of, of, of a story of Pio Paschini. Um, uh, there is a person of the church that was, was asked to write a new biography of Galileo in the 1940s. 
uh, and he did. Uh, and then they prohibited his book because he <laughs> was too sympathetic to Galileo. <laughs> and then when they finally published it, the church published it, when they finally published it, it, it was edited so heavily that, you know, his entire meaning was changed in some sentences. So, uh, so it really took a long time. It took a long time for this to happen. Yeah. So, so what can we do? I mean, does thinking about Galileo's struggles provide any lessons for us or any ideas about how we can fight this tendency of people to reject science? You know, I, um, I, I gave this a lot of thought. And let me tell you why I am not that optimistic. Um, there are studies, not just about science denial, studies about all kinds of opinions and things like that, you know, opinions people have. It turns out these studies mostly show that when adults already formed an opinion, uh, it is extremely difficult to change that opinion, even when they are presented with contradicting facts. And what that means is that perhaps the only way to try to do this is through the education system with young kids, you know, when they just start. The point is the following. Not everybody should be a scientist. Absolutely not. I mean, God forbid. We need the humanists. We need, you know, the philosophers. We need all of those. We need the artists. We need all of those people. But even people who are not scientists should be given a feeling of what science does and an appreciation of what science does. You know, everybody should know, for example, that today life expectancy is twice what it was in Galileo's time. And this is only because of science. Everybody should know that, you know, in the phone book, I'm, I, in, the phone, in the phone we're using, yes, right now, I just took my phone. We all use a GPS system, right? I mean, and it helps us to get there, you know, use Waze or whatever, you know, to get to somewhere. Uh, there are two corrections that are being made uh, by this, by those satellites with which this phone connects. And one of the correction is because of Einstein's special theory of relativity, and another one because of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, everybody who thought that their everyday life has nothing to do with special relativity and general relativity, it does, it does. Because had we not made these corrections, you would have been off by a mile or so every day if we didn't make these corrections because of this theory. So, so I'm not saying that everybody should know how those theories, you know, enter into that thing, which, which is, by the way, not that complicated. You don't need to calculate it. But, but the idea is that, you know, you have objects that are far away and they are moving very fast. These are the satellites, yes? And, and those are the reasons for these two things. But to understand that science enters into everything, you know, the fact that we even have a phone at all is, of course, because of quantum mechanics and other things that we know in physics. So this appreciation of science uh, and what science can do and what it cannot do should be started from small children. Uh, and, and I think that that is the only way uh, to do this, because by the time people are adults, it's, excuse me, extremely difficult to change their minds. It's interesting because in a way, science itself is the antidote to the problem you mentioned of people just not being able to change their opinions because science itself is all about changing your picture of the situation when confronted with new information, right? Science is the only <laughs> mechanism we have for moving aside from our psychological barriers and tendencies and trying to judge things objectively. Yes, and also to understand always that science can be wrong, you know, based on data available at a particular time, you know, you may come to the wrong conclusion, but with time, it, it will improve. So you're, you're not too optimistic about the future or you are? 
I'm not that optimistic. I mean, look, like I say, we need to make people appreciate science. And the type of stuff that you do and Scientific American does, and the type of stuff that I try to do by writing these popular science books, you know, and so on, uh, works in, in other extremely good science writers do, works in that direction, uh, hopefully. Uh, but, you know, I would not have the illusion that it changes things dramatically, because it doesn't. Um, so I, I think that the only way is really through the education system from a very young age. Well, on a somewhat lighter note, let's move on to this this story that you're going to tell us so um in the process in the course of researching for your book um you did a little uh historical detective work that we want to hear about the story relates to a, a famous motto attributed to galileo and yet it moves have you heard about this motto before um is this something that you have come across how how prevalent is this now obviously uh the the motto galileo never said and yet it moves tell us uh the actual words of the motto in italian yeah he said e pur si muove and what is what is that referring to and yet what moves uh, well it's the earth yes so so yeah the, the 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 it refers to the earth moving you know around the sun basically you know that the the church was saying that the earth was at the center and therefore it doesn't move and the Copernican model, which he advocated, said that the Earth revolves around the sun and therefore moves. So tell us about the story. Um, how did you even decide to look into the history of this quote? Right. So, uh, so the story is that uh, the story itself is that uh, when the trial of Galileo finished, and uh, you know, in the trial, uh, he basically was forced to give an abjuration in which he to recant and say that everything he said is not true and the earth doesn't move and the earth is at the center and all that he was forced to do to do all that and his book was put on the index of prohibited books and the story is that uh, at that point he sort of stamped with his foot on the ground after the the whole thing finished and said e pur si muove, and yet it moves as a defiant thing, you know, to, to, to say, uh, you know, in spite of what you may believe, these are the facts. Um, okay, so, so this was the story. And uh, Favaro, who is the big historian of Galileo, started it in the 1880s and worked for 40 years to write Galileo's biography and, you know, write everything about to contextualize his, his work and everything. Um, did a huge amount of research trying to find where did this motto first appear. And he discovered that the motto first appeared, as far as he could tell, uh, was in a book uh, by somebody named Giuseppe Barretti uh, in 1757. This is more than 100 years after Galileo's death. And therefore, he thought that that may mean that this is apocryphal, that, you know, okay, it was invented at some point, but uh, it wasn't true. But then uh, in 1911, uh, he received a letter from somebody, from a Belgian person named Jules Van Belle, uh, who lived in a small town in Belgium called Rosselare. Uh, and that person told him that he has a painting uh, which uh, he, he told him the whole story of how he got to that painting, but it, which is this painting that we see here, uh, which Favaro never actually saw the painting. He saw just this photograph of the painting, this black and white photograph, which uh, uh, Van Bele said that this was painted by, apparently by the famous Spanish painter uh, Bartolome Esteban Murillo, uh, and the painting was from 1643 or 45, which meant just a couple of years after Galileo's death. And that in this painting on the wall before, before Galileo there, Galileo is holding here in his right hand something like a nail and uh, with which he marked some things on the wall. 
And there, there is a marking of the earth moving around the sun and the words of Porosimove underneath. Now, this was a dramatic thing because you see, if this were to be true, uh, and Van Bele said it absolutely was true, then this means that the motto was already known just a couple of years after Galileo's death. So, you know, this would have made it very uh, plausible that he actually said it. May probably not to the Inquisition. I mean, that was would have been crazy for him to say that to the Inquisition, but he said it to somebody, and uh, in particular, you know, maybe to the uh, bishop in whose house he, he, he stayed, he spent his first six months of house arrest, uh, and that somehow got into this painting. Uh, so this was the idea. So a number of science historians changed their views and said that, well, now they believe that actually he probably said it. Uh, when I looked into this, I well, first of all, I discovered all of Favara's work. But then I discovered something very strange, that that painting has not been seen at all since 1912. Uh, nobody has seen it, no, as far as I could tell initially. I mean, it, you know, in the internet, you couldn't find where it is. There are people who wrote articles, where is that painting? Da, da, da. It, it, it wasn't there. Uh, and uh, so, so I thought that that was very, very strange that it couldn't be found. Um, so, you know, I decided that I need to find out what's going on with this with this painting. Also, I discovered that no serious art historian really checked the painting to see whether it is really from 1643, is it really by Murillo, you know, and so on. Hmm. So what I did was I started, uh, you know, not with much hope, uh, sent this picture to four Murillo experts, two in Spain, uh, he was a Spanish painter, uh, one in the UK and one in New York. Uh, and they all came back and that they did not believe that this was painted by Murillo. They all said, you know, it's very hard to tell from a picture of this quality and so on, but, you know, neither the style, not the subject matter, not the things, didn't this. Uh, Murillo probably was ne not even in Madrid during the years that he was supposed to paint this in 1643. And, and so so they, they say, no, I said, oh, well, that, that makes it interesting. So I started digging, digging. I uh, co connect, uh, contacted the Royal Museum in Brussels, you know, to see whether they had any connections with this Jules van Belle. Um, the painting, by the way, was described, uh, the story was described in a book in 1929 uh, by an historian named Fahi, but he, he never saw the painting itself. He just told the story. Uh, and then through that, you know, I'm making everything much shorter, but uh, I discovered that actually in 1936, uh, I found two newspapers, Belgian newspapers, that said that the painting was exhibited at the Fleece House Museum in Antwerp. Um, so I contacted a curator there and uh, she discovered that she didn't know that it was exhibited there, but she discovered actually a note from 1933 where Jund van Belle actually uh, gave the painting on loan to that museum, the Fleece House Museum in, in Antwerp. And um, also, um, in the in the newspaper stories, they basically repeated what Van Pelle told them, uh, you know, and so on. So this was already interesting, but uh, they still didn't say where is the painting now. And then I discovered a bombshell, and this was that in a in the small town of uh, Saint Nicholas. Uh, if we, I can see the next uh, slide that you have there. Um, they actually had a painting which was in their collection, and here it is. And you can tell that it's the same painting or a very similar one uh, to that one. You know, it shows Galileo uh, there with the, the painting is called Galileo in prison, by the way, and he holds the nail in his hand. This painting actually was in the collection of this museum since 1904, roughly, uh, and it was given. Uh, by a, a, a known collector, 
um, and the, this painting, everything is known about it. It, it, it was actually painted uh, in the middle of the 19th century uh, by uh, somebody named Eugene Roman van Maldechem, who was a Flemish painter, and he painted this. So now we had a situation where I was dealing with two paintings, uh, one which van Bele had, and one which was in, you know, because it was a different painting because that went to this house and so on. This one, this one wasn't there. This was all the time in St. Nic Nicholas. So uh, it, it was clear that because the paintings were so identical that one of them must be a copy of the other. Mm -hmm. Only it wasn't sure which one. So I started studying Van Maldechem, the painter who painted this painting. And he was a fairly known painter. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I discovered books that were written during his lifetime. Mm. And they mentioned this particular painting, uh, and, and, but not, it, it, it was a definitely supposed to be an original painting by him. So uh, it started to look as if the other painting may have been a copy of this one in which case would have made it a much later painting from the middle of the 19th century and not from the middle of the 17th century. Right. Um, but it was still not clear what happened to the actual painting, the, uh, the Van Bellis painting. Uh, oh, by the way, there is a si small side story. Uh, how much time do we have? If, I, if, if You have a little bit more time. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I discovered that there was another painting called Galileo in prison, uh, which was painted by another Flemish painter named Henri Grégoire, and was painted in the same year that Van Maldechem painted his painting. So, I, and but that painting luckily was put on auction twice in 2000, and I managed to get a picture of it, and it's a very different painting. I mean, uh, now the two painters, Van Maldechem and Grégoire, were both of them students of the same Flemish painter. So mm. I suspect that he gave them the idea of painting, uh, you know, Galileo in prison, but they did two very different paintings. Mm. Anyhow, so I, I con continue to study this Van Bele person. Uh, and I discovered that Van Bele, well, I discovered all the places where he lived over the years. Uh, the question was, you see, where is his painting? And I thought, you know, okay, maybe it was destroyed during World War II because the last it was now seen was 1936. Uh, maybe uh, he sold it, uh, or maybe uh, some a relative of his inherited it, and or or maybe they sold it. Now I discovered that he never married, and his uh, closest uh, person who outlived him was his niece. Uh, and his niece, um, she married somebody else and so on. So I, I discovered her. Okay, uh, good. I discovered where she lived in a number of places. By the way, all of this is what I'm describing to you is extremely difficult because there is also a law now in Belgium uh, that says that you cannot find such information for 120 years since the person dies. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah. so it, it, it was all very, very tough. Uh, but in any case, I eventually, through some genealogy uh, uh, research, I discovered a great-grandson of that niece, a living great-grandson of that niece. And he heard that there was once a Jules Van Bene, <laughs> but who was, you know, who was the uncle of that. Of that niece, uh, and that he may have had some paintings, but he had no idea what was happening. I asked him to ask if he could ask his parents and so on. Bottom line, his mother discovered that the grandmother of this great grandson uh, saw gave some paintings to be sold to the Campo and Campo um, auction house hmm. in Antwerp. And uh, believe it or not, but uh, in 2007, uh, there was uh, the auction 
And one of the items on that auction, item 213, was called Galileo in prison. Wow. But the but Campo and Campo also determined, their experts determined that the painting was from the 19th century. Mm. Um, and I asked them if I could get a picture of, oh, by the way, in this painting, just if you can show the next slide, on the wall, actually, that faces Galileo, there is indeed a drawing of the earth moving around the sun and the words a pur si move underneath. So it is indeed there. Okay. Uh, now I got the a picture of the painting from Campo and Campo, and that is in the next slide here. And this is it. <laughs> An identical painting. Wow. As you can tell. Yes, only that. First of all, there is no signature of Murillo on it. There is no 1643 or 45 on it. Hmm. Uh, and the painting was judged to be from the 19th century. Huh. Uh, so most likely somebody copied uh, the Van Maldechem's painting, uh, which actually hung for a while in church in Amsterdam. Now, uh, you know, auction houses are not allowed to say who bought this in 2007, uh, but I do know that it was not a dealer, it was a, a private person who bought this painting. So what that means is that the motto's first appearance is in Baretti's book, more than a hundred years after Galileo's death. Hmm. So the story probably is apocryphal. But it doesn't change the fact that this is certainly what Galileo thought after his trial, right. you know, and yet it moves, because he remained bitter about that for the rest of his life. <laughs> you know, he was a house arrest. You know, if you think now we, for us, lockdown for a few months, we are going crazy. He was on lockdown for about eight and a half years. Yeah. So uh, eight years or so. So um, uh, he was on house arrest. His books were put on the index of prohibited books. I mean, it could have been much worse. I mean, you know, let's face it, the, the church was somewhat lenient with him, but, uh, you know, but, but still. Uh, and so he, he definitely thought that. And it is also true that the motto remains as, you know, a symbol of intellectual defiant. You know, in spite of what you may think, here are the facts. Right, right. Well, thank you for that story. It is. It is a little disappointing that he probably never said it, but whoever thought of it seemed to have uh, channeled his spirit quite well. <laughs> yes. We're going to move to the question and answer portion uh, of the discussion right now. Here's our first question is from Florentina Lesteru. The question is, was there a point in history when Galileo's reputation started to be reinstated and when he became popularly accepted? Uh Yes, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, clearly everybody knows that he is accepted today, for example. Um, so, yes, uh, already, you know, relatively not that long after his death, um, he became uh, much more popular. Uh, people started even long before his book was taken off the index. All the scientists started using the Copernican system. Um, the famous poet John Milton visited Galileo uh, during his house arrest, uh, and he actually uh, wrote uh, a very famous uh, freedom of speech essay, which was actually even used when uh, the U.S. Constitution was written, um, which mentioned specifically Galileo by name, that, you know, it was uh, uh, an assault on intellectual freedom, basically. So, so yes, uh, there were uh, lots, and there were many books written about Galileo, many favorable, um, already in the you know hundred year period after his death. And in fact, that sort of raises the question: Why were so many people painting portraits of Galileo and circulating this motto then in the nineteenth century? Did he sort of have a, a moment of fame then? Of course, and also uh, look, I mean. Immediately, shortly after his thing, 
uh, his fate had a chilling effect on scientific uh, research, especially in Italy, but not only in Italy. Uh, the famous scientist and philosopher René Descartes uh, actually wrote, after he heard about Galileo's trial, he wrote that he was so shocked that he thought at first to burn all his books, or certainly at least not to publish them because of the effect. So, so there was a period of time when, you know, his trial had a chilling effect and the church did everything it could for it to have a chilling effect. So it took a while until, you know, the resurgence. And this is probably also the reason that people started painting things related to his imprisonment and thing only in the 19th century and not, not yeah. much earlier than that. Interesting, yeah. Okay, our next question is from Brian Finn. Did religion impact Galileo's communication with Kepler? What was their relationship like? Yeah, so their relationship was at the beginning quite good and then very bad. <laughs> uh, because, uh, because Galileo was, uh, like I said, not the nicest person. <laughs> uh, so Ke Kepler was a great astronomer, uh, but he was also a mystic uh, and a very religious person. Um, and, um, you know, at first they discussed simply Galileo's discoveries with the telescope. Um, but then when they started disagreeing on some things, for example, Galileo had a completely wrong theory of tides, for example, sea tides. Uh, Kepler actually had the correct ideas and things like that. So, um, so at, at some point they, they really broke off. But uh, but on, initially they they were okay, and I think that I think that the reason for uh, the breakup uh, was not necessarily because of religious re reasons. It was really because of Galileo's uh, somewhat impossible personality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question is from Linus. What can the youth do to promote appreciation of science? What can the youth do? Yeah, you, I mean, you talked about young people and how yes. we have to reach them. Well, I, well, yeah, I talked more about what can the educators of the young people do. Right. Uh, now, this person, which whom I assume is a young person, uh, asks what they, what they can do. Uh, I'll tell you what they can do. They can be curious. That is the thing that they can do. They have to be curious and ask many questions and ask questions of their science teacher, of, of, of their social studies teachers, of, you know, of, of, of their uh, humanities teachers, you know, literature teachers, and so on. They can read books. Uh, uh, you know, uh, people today, um, as I'm sure you know only too well uh, from the job you're in, it's not that people read less, but they read fewer books. Mm -hmm. uh, people read shorter things, they read headlines, uh, they read uh, short blog pieces, uh, things like that. Um, they read quite a bit, but they read fewer books. Uh, and there is a lot to be said about reading books. I'm, uh, uh, well, you can look behind me and, uh, <laughs> and I'm a great book lover. And uh, I think that uh, for young people, to read books, I think, uh, is great. This is why, by the way, I, I'm saying this not, not because I want to advertise anything, but, um, you, you know, uh, writer J.K. Rowling, uh, I think, did something phenomenal in that suddenly young people suddenly started reading books of 700 pages, uh, you know, in the Harry Potter series. So. I think that that is incredible. I wish there were more writers like this who can convince young children to to read such, uh, you know, serious. Well, not serious in the sense of subject matter, but serious books in in terms of the writing. Yeah, read books and magazines. <laughs> Correct. Yes. <laughs> um, all right. This next question, I'm quite curious about the answer to. Um, it's from Felipe Bedoya. Is it true that Galileo's corpse lacks three fin fingers? Yes. 
it's it's true. It's absolutely true. Uh, well, it lacks not just the fingers, and I actually have pictures of the fingers because in the research for this book, I spent uh, some time at the Galileo Museum in Florence, um, and um, and they gave me access to their library and things and so on. And and actually, in the museum, uh, you can see his fingers, uh, um, and 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 also a tooth. Uh, there is a tooth, and there are fingers. Uh, which were removed from his body. I'm not sure why, when his body was removed from a temporary grave. Well, temporary, it was there for a hundred years, but yes. but when he was buried, the church didn't allow to make a big, uh, you know, a big tomb for him. Uh, so he was buried in a, in a very obscure place of, of, of the church uh, of Santa Croce. Uh, but then he was moved because that student of his, Vincenzo Viviani, had actually left money for him to be moved to a, to a very impressive uh, mm. uh, tomb, um, uh, which is actually right in front of Michelangelo's tomb in, in, the, in the cathedral of, of, of Santa Croce. Um, and um, so, so there is the tooth, there is this, and there is also a vertebra that's also, uh, <laughs> outside yeah that tomb which which is missing so yes there are some parts that uh, were missing wow <laughs> um so our another question is are there living descendants of galileo no there aren't um yeah i, I actually looked into in into that and uh, unfortunately there aren't um I, I i don't recall off the top of my head uh, but i did write it in the book uh, when the last descendant died, but it was uh, sometime in the middle of the 18th century. Um, mm. uh, and uh, yes, unfortunately, no. Uh, the, the thing is, you see, a number of uh, his descendants uh, became uh, people of the nuns and things like that. I mean, he, uh, his two daughters uh, were, were nuns. Um, one of them became uh, very famous. Uh, uh, because uh, a book was written about her, Galileo's daughter, um, because there is a correspondence of more than a hundred letters that survived from her to him. Um, she was a very sensitive person, but she died in her thirties, uh, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, the other daughter, very little is known about her because once she was put in that convent, um, she didn't adjust too well, and uh, you know. Uh, all we know about her comes from the letters of her sister. Uh, mm. But her sister, as I say, died uh, very young. Uh, he had a son. His son, uh, uh, they were all, by the way, illegitimate children, all three. Um, and uh, the problem was that at that time, uh, for illegitimate daughters, it was very, a very difficult life because uh, they could, in order for them to marry, they would have had to have uh, incredible dowries, and, and, mm -hmm. and even Galileo could not pay that. Um, it, so it was not uncommon to put uh, daughters in, in the convent. Uh, the son, uh, well, because of the biases at the time, uh, um, was eventually made legitimate by the Grand Duke. Um, mm. And, uh, and and so he had a, a normal life uh, and had children and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I I did create at some point the family tree. Uh, well, I didn't have to create it. Favaro already did it, but I I did uh, I did follow that. Uh, but nobody survived. Yeah. Mm, interesting. So we have a question from Robert Schwartz. What was Galileo's role in the development of the law of inertia? So that was one of Kepler's laws. Uh, well, the, uh, well, no, I think he is talking about the law of inertia, which became um, Newton's first law of motion, uh, which, which basically means that in the absence of any forces, uh, a body will remain in a, motion, uh, in a motion at constant speed or at rest. Uh, and uh, what was his role? I mean, basically, he formulated it. Mm -hmm. so, so Galileo actually formulated Newton's first law of motion, mm -hmm. um, only he didn't call it 
well, not only not Newton, because Newton <laughs> lived later, but he didn't call it the first law of motion, but, but this was, yeah. And, and this was remarkable, actually, because think about this. In everyday experience, you never see such a thing. There is nothing that you could see in everyday experience that moves at a constant speed and doesn't stop. There is nothing, because there is always friction of some force. So, so th this took uh, an incredible intuition to think that, ah, if I could have it without any forces, then it probably would go on moving on a straight line at a constant speed. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So, okay, here's a question from Gulsa. In the play of Bertolt Brecht, there yeah. is a saying attributed to Galileo that goes, Science knows only one commandment, contribute to science. Did Galileo really say this phrase? Um, I don't remember this. Uh, I mean, I remember the play. Uh, it, it's a wonderful play and it uh, sort of um, popularized some of the myths about uh, <laughs> Galileo. Uh, I don't remember this exact phrase that Galileo said. So I, I don't think he said it quite verbatim like that. Mm. But but he probably, you know, he may have said something that was similar to that or or in, in that spirit. Yeah. There is, by the way, not just a play, but there is an opera by Philip Glass about, which is called Galileo. That's yeah. He certainly looms large. He represents a lot of things to a lot of people at different times in history. Yeah. He, he is, you know, one of those uh, larger than life uh, persons in, in scientific history, yes in spite yeah. of his faults and uh, weaknesses, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, we have a question from Austin. Do you think scientists should move beyond expectations of objectivity and become more vocal advocates in politics? Ah, that is a, a question that I'm not sure I want to answer. Uh, let me think for a second. Um, no, I. I think that scientists should stick to the science. However, they should speak the science clearly in a way that, you know, can influence politics. Um, we have examples in, in history for, um, you know, good examples of this and not so good. I mean, you know, there is the famous letter that Einstein signed that, that you know, went to President Roosevelt that led to the development of the nuclear, for the atomic bomb, yes, the, the nuclear bomb. Um, so he always regretted that uh, later, uh, having written that. But, you know, when you think about the context in which that happened, it was that there was an enormous fear that the Nazis will develop such uh, a weapon. Uh, and, and that's what actually led to this. Um, you know, we have an example now. Um, I think, uh, you, you know, I, I, I will take an example from every day. I mean, we have Dr. Fauci, right, who speaks about the COVID-19, <coughs> excuse me, uh, pandemic. And he tries, as much as he can to stay out of the politics, but nevertheless to speak his mind about what he thinks about the science. You know, so when he's asked, I've just seen him the other day, that he's asked, so what does he think about the success or not of dealing with the pandemic in the US? And he said, you don't need a sound bite from me. Just look at the numbers. You know, and that's what it is. You know, look at the numbers. We have 4% of the world's population and more than 20% of the world's dead. You know, you, you don't have to be a scientist to understand that there is something that's not right here. Um, so, so I don't think that that scientists should get directly involved in the politics. I, I, I think they should speak their scientific mind 
and and let that if necessary influence the politics i lost your voice right, i'm back i was muted um it's it's interesting that in recent years i have heard more and more calls for scientists to not only speak up about politics but to actually run for office and it does make you wonder what a country or a world would look like if if scientists were not just advocating for policy but actually making policy look uh, look i mean there have been scientists who have been in politics i mean uh, in the past i mean uh, the first president of the state of Israel, where I grew up, was Chaim Weizmann, uh, who was a chemist. Um, you know, he was a scientist. Uh, Albert Einstein was actually offered to be the first president. <laughs> and he said, you know, he didn't want to do that. But uh, so, I mean, so it's not, it's not without uh, a parallel or that it hasn't happened before and it will happen more. Uh, uh, we had here an energy secretary who was a Nobel laureate uh, in the U.S., right? And uh, look, I think that it would make perfect sense, for example, let, let's say, let's suppose that the U.S. wanted to, to really develop a, a, a serious policy concerning climate, yes? Uh, it, it would probably make perfect sense to have a person that you know is maybe an atmospheric scientist or something you know in charge of that type of activity uh, in the same way i mean you could argue that having a task force to deal with a pandemic or something you know it always involves some scientists so so scientists are involved um, uh, i don't know about running for office uh, well ben franklin <laughs> of course <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, so they have been scientists, and I'm sure there will be some more. But you, you know, as a general question, I I see the role of scientists as providing the information, right. and, uh, and 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 trying to influence decisions when they have to do uh, with science. Uh, for example, I think that the, the position of a science advisor to the president should be an important position, uh, especially yeah. when the modern world, there are many, many decisions that require some understanding of science, you know, so be it with pandemics, be it with climate, you know, being all kinds of things of this nature. But that requires a president who would listen to a science advisor. Of course, of course, yes. Uh, I mean, look, it goes without saying. I mean, if you have an advisor that nobody listens to, of course, why do you have an advisor at all? <laughs> I think that's a good question for our time. Well, okay. I, I, I want to mention something, uh, Clara. I mean, not in response to a question. There, there is a phrase which I uh, I now wrote in several places, and uh, I, I find it very important. I think for our times, uh, and this is a phrase that was written by philosopher Hannah Arendt, um, and, and and she wrote something that is. Uh, almost frightening, I would say. And she, she wrote, um, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction or between true and false no longer exists. Think about this for a minute and you, you know, let it sink in. You know, these are, she said, the ideal subjects of totalitarian rule. When you no longer know the distinction between true and false. Mm -hmm. uh, I find this almost ominous, I would say, you know, yeah. that that's the situation. Yeah, I mean, do you think that we're we're moving in that direction? Uh, you know, it's not for me to to make predictions, certainly not about politics, but uh, there is no question, I think, that we see not just in the U.S. I mean, you know, we have seen in recent years lots of places, you know, Turkey, Hungary, Brazil, 
where people who have been democratically elected have taken the country more towards totalitarian rule. Uh, at some level, Israel is in that situation. You know, when you have a prime minister that has been there for as long as the current one is, uh, and plus has some issues with, with the law, uh, this is a problem. Um, I, I want to remind people, <laughs> maybe some people don't remember, that Hitler was democratically elected. Mm -hmm. uh, so, some people have this, I think, incorrect notion that totalitarian rule happens only via some sort of a coup or, you know, some military coup or something like this. Not true. Mm -hmm. Many times it happens by a slow but constant erosion of democracy. And these are the types of things we should always be aware of and always try to fight. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a nice note to, to cap this off on. Um, and, and I just wanna thank you so much, Mario, for speaking with me today. This has been fascinating. Thank you very much, Clara. Thank you, Mario.